summary of, of the material we have so far. Uh, today we're going to look into the last section of engineering economics. But before we do that, let's just quickly see how we got to this point. So we started off by looking at the time value of money. This cash flow diagram. <coughs> And just some key points to summarize there. Um, we have money in and out uh, during a period. By convention, we consider all those cash flows to have uh, the net event to occur at the end of the period. slightly different to some other conventions used in other economics courses, but in all the engineering economics textbooks, this is a standard convention that the net cash flow occurs at the end of the period, and we count our periods from zero to capital A. So those, that's what we covered pretty much in the first uh, first uh, parts of the class. Then we immediately went and we showed a formula to be able to exchange a value from a future period, next period, and bring it back to today's period. So we exchange a future cash flow or a future expense, whatever that value is, and we deflate it and bring it into today's money. Or conversely, we can take the present present value of money and inflate it to future value the sum of 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 the sum
once we have our, our cash flows, plot those cash flows in NPV terms against time, against every period, N, 0, 1, 2, 3. That gives you a great idea of how the profitability of the project is changing. It also indicates very clearly when your project will break even. So you will get a measure of payback time from that graph as well. So let's just uh, emphasize here one, one important thing to plot. NPV versus N, so your lowercase n period. What you, sorry, so what are you doing that? Are you plotting the period zero value in period one, two, three, four, whatever? Okay. So you make a plot, uh, it looks lowercase n, we're plotting our NPV, and then we're plotting our cumulative cash flow. So put the NPV subscript. So we're seeing a, a, a very large negative at the beginning. Usually, the most engineering projects where we're spending a substantial amount of capital and our cumulative cash flow over time. That's a, that's a helpful one to, to visualize. So, let's emphasize that this is cumulative NPV versus the number of periods. <laughs> Extremely helpful plot to visualize the profitability or the flow of money over time. Uh, at one point in the class, I called that cash velocity. Um, I've since been informed that that's a standard economics term that means something slightly different. So, um, but it does. It's, a, it's very descriptive. It's how your cash is changing over time. It's essentially a velocity. But uh, don't use that terminology. Find people who have it. Okay, so. So those are two, uh, the first two sections, the TBM section and the profitability section. We spent about two to three weeks in those. Um, then very recently we looked at the concept of depreciation and taxes and then added to yesterday's class we looked at sensitivity. So let's take a look at those quick. Um, I'll bring that board back. For so, uh, depreciation, or as the government of Canada will call it the CCA, Capital Cost Allowance, really is just a way uh, to fairly decline the value of an asset over time. Uh, we like to appreciate. It helps us get a, get a fair estimate of that asset. And here, when we say an asset, it's not just the capital cost, it's uh, capital <laughs> plus installation plus engineering fees. And several other terms are, are valid that, that increase the value of that building. So, all of those fees add up to create the value of the asset, which we then depreciate gradually over time. Um, what that does is it, it avoids creating a large expense in the time period end where we install and, and start to use that asset. So, it avoids creating a large expense in period end where the asset is used. And that's just for fairness because we cannot validly expense the entire asset in that period when we know that it will have a longer lifetime. So to, we cannot artificially deflate our, the amount of net profit we make, so income minus tax, income minus expenses. We cannot take this large hit on the expenses to reduce our taxes. So the government prevents us from doing that. So what depreciation essentially does is, uh, let's emphasize here, depreciation, this is the key point, is not a cash flow. Okay, that, that's a critical concept to understand. Depreciation is not an amount of money that changes hands anyway. But what it does, it is a mechanism to reduce tax pay. 
And that brings us to our next next uh, entry that we looked at in this section, which was taxes. So taxes then. These are a negative cash flow. So prior to this point in the course, we had only looked at income and expenses uh, in, our, in our cash flow diagrams. We never considered the effect of taxes. But taxes is a very important expense that every company has to face. Um, and it's calculated at a fixed rate after accounting for depreciation. So depreciation is a mechanism to reduce tax pay because it, it reduces the amount before we multiply by the tax rate. So it's a negative cash flow as a result of it. it will always reduce NPV from the non-tax situation. And I'll just make a note here that um, we generally don't use the tax rate nor the depreciation rate in a sensitivity analysis. So I had some people ask me about that uh, by email and after the class. Don't use the tax rate nor the depreciation rate in sensitivity analysis. The main reason is that neither of those two factors are uncertain. So the sensitivity analysis, which was the part we looked at last, uh, the last class, is really to investigate the effect of uncertainty of certain variables. The main being uh, things like sales, volumes, cost of raw materials. Those terms are, are certainly the, the, um, some of the most the percentage throughput that your plant will be operating at. Your plant, like in the Brazil example in assignment five, you build it for 10,000 tons per, per, per year, but you're only starting it at 7,000. So you start at a lower rate, and that may just be because it's your best guess of what the market's going to be able to handle. But that 7,000 could be lower, it could be higher, depending on when you actually start to build and operate the plant. You may discover that the market for that product is smaller or greater than anticipated. So that's it. that number would be something that goes in the sensitivity analysis. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring this back down again and uh, take you back to this slide. I posted this one on the website because it's not originally in the notes. So you can get this off the course website. There's one alternative way to visualize sensitivity data. Um, and the key interpretation here is the steepness of that slope. And the steeper the slope, obviously, the greater the impact on NPV will be. And crucially, particularly those lines that cross uh, the zero NPV and reduce our break even would be um, would you consider it. Then just one other diagram that I ended up with in the last few minutes of the class yesterday. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm sure today. Uh, yeah, yesterday, Thursday. That I just wanted to draw again and talk about in a bit more detail is um, that sort of idea of investigating multiple scenarios. And I had uh, an experimental design type concept going over here. Just being a stats guy, I tend to think like this. But if we had one variable here on this horizontal axis, let's call that the raw material cost. Uh, so this is my raw material cost. So this is a low, low raw material cost. There's a high raw material cost. And here at the center is my anticipated or expected value of that cost. So as raw materials are cheaper than what I, my base case, so here's my base case at, at the center. If raw materials are cheaper than my base case, what will my NPV be over here? Higher NPV, lower NPV? Higher NPV with lower raw material costs. And as I move across this horizontal direction, my NPV will will get smaller and smaller as my raw material cost increases. So this is high NPV. If this axis here, the vertical axis, was uh, the sales price, 
with uh, the sales price being my baseline over here, my anticipated sales price, if this point down here was low sales price and this point up here was high sales price, I would expect a similar idea. Over down here with low sales, I'm going to have a low NPV. As my sales price is higher than my, I have anticipated, my NPV is going to go up. So this is the direction of NPV. So here NPV is high, here NPV is lower and lower. So what we'll often do is we'll establish a, our cash flow diagrams for the base case, for this point here in the center. Let's just write that over here, that's my base case. And then what people will do is they'll look at combinations of these factors. So here I've identified two variables, sales price as a parameter, uh, let's call this raw material cost parameter P1, let's call sales price P2. And one thing I could do is I could visualize this data on a plot that looked something like that. So P1 and P2 would be either sales price or raw material cost, and I could visualize what the effect of NPV is on that gradient type curve. Here's the same idea. Really what I'm saying is that my worst combination of these is what? What would be the absolute, what would create the worst NPV possible? Exactly, so low sales down here and high raw material costs. So this would be my worst case combination. Um, as people might call this, They'll call this your downside scenario. This is the worst combination of everything possible. Everything goes wrong for you, and that's your NPV at that stage. This is your base case, and then your, um, because these things tend to be linear, this point up here would be your most optimistic case. <laughs> or your upside, as it's often referred to. So this is sales are greater than you ever expected and your raw material costs are lower. And there would be a, some gradient through, through this that you could plot lines of equal NPV moving into that direction. So this would be your worst NPV, gradually moving up to your NPV being the best possible. What you're interested in is what this line. If this line, even at the worst combination of sales price and raw material cost, even if that line has still got a positive NPV, you've got a, a good degree of comfort that this project is going to, to work out well. Because anything else is going to be up to the top left and it's going to just be better than you ever expected. Sometimes though this might already be a negative NPV, but then you weigh that with the fact that the probabilities of low sales price and high raw material costs, you may expect that probability of that combination of events to be fairly low. Notice that we're moving to changing both variables simultaneously. This is a key point why I wanted to emphasize this. In the previous slides, what we did is we were looking at changing one variable at a time, changing capital costs, keeping everything else constant changing raw material costs, keeping sales and capital costs fixed. This is not the case here. Here we're plotting the effect of changing both variables simultaneously. And we're establishing a more realistic scenario than some of these plots over here. Okay? So, so working with these sort of ideas of, of fractional factorials and factorial design, uh, especially when you go to three or four or five uncertain parameters, which for a realistic cash flow, uh, you're going to have multiple uncertain parameters. You can handle that quite nicely using some of the ideas of experimental design and fraction factorial. So you establish a establish your NPV for for a limited number of combinations, and then make sure that at least for most or all those combinations, your NPV is positive. Would be the desirable. Okay, so that's just a quick recap of where we where we've been. Uh, now let's move on to the new section, uh, which is this section here on capital cost estimation. So we're now coming to the fact of how do we estimate this huge negative at the start? That's really what this section is about. That flow of money that leaves our company bank account, how do we learn to estimate that value? Okay, so 
here's a bit of a, a case study that Dr. Marlin has put together. I wasn't aware of this. Um, so Cinecrew is a company in Alberta. More correctly, it's a conglomerate of companies out in Alberta. Um, it's a joint own. You can't buy stock in Cinecrew, for example. It's jointly owned by Imperial Oil, Suncor, Sinopec, a Chinese company. Um, Conoco Phillips in the US used to own a part of it, but they now sold their, their, their portion. So it's a conglomerate of about seven or eight oil companies that own substantial investments in the oil sands in Alberta. Uh, they, they process that heavy oil into synthetic crude, and they supply about 13% of Canada's energy demands from the oil source. Okay, so it's an important company from a Canadian perspective, as well as a major employer in Alberta. So they, they, uh, they've been around since the 1960s, but then in 2002, there was a plan to expand uh, a substantial part of their operation up there. To this added expansion would, would uh, provide them about 10,000 barrels per day. That's 16,000 liters cubed per day of, of crude. That was their initial estimate of the project's cost, $3.6 billion. When they corrected it to $4.6 billion, another correction of $5.1 billion. So almost double. And then most, the final as built cost in 2007, $8.4 billion. So way, way off from that very first estimate that they published back in 2002. Okay. <laughs> I like Dr. Marlin's notation here. So don't let this be you, that's uh, the person responsible, partly responsible for this. We're going to see in this part of the class today, we're looking at these initial estimates. We're going to see that the estimate error is as much as 50 to 100 percent. We're very poorly, it's not possible to estimate highly accurate estimates of these um, of these costs. So this is not not too surprising. So this is a fairly big package, but probably a little bit bigger than than we normally have in terms of our errors. Especially uh, considering that the idea they should have had a finalized design. So I would have understood a 3.6 to 4.6 billion dollar change, but uh, going from 3.6 to 8.4, um, unless the scope changed radically, that would be a substantial error in terms of the point. So I want you to just talk to the person to the left or the right of you for two, three minutes and understand or convince each other why is this important skill to work. Why do we have to have the ability to estimate capital costs? So Apart from screwing up it like that, we can this like, what are the other reasons that are important for us to be able to estimate the capital cost? So let's brainstorm for a few minutes and we'll have it on the board.
contractor in and he'll tell you it's 12,000 and you get a third one and you get 15,000. How do you know if you're being charged the right amount? Um, and if you're in Hamilton, you're lucky the contract is short. So that's um, an important skill, right? We're going to be dealing with managed outside companies that are managing the project for us. How do we prevent ourselves from being screwed over? Uh, are they cost reported reasonable and reasonable? Yeah. It's a key skill in perform performing a feasibility analysis, outweighing, uh, looking at all your options and going with the right one. Okay, so it's an important skill for just evaluating the feasibility on the flow sheet. You may want to pick an alternative technology or an alternative uh, way of producing the same material. Um, after you've done a very preliminary analysis, you realize the cost is excessive for one method over the other method. For accounting purposes? For accounting purposes? Yeah, so if, if you're sort of trying to estimate um, where I'm going to be, um, the value of my, my company, and if you need to hire this sort of workforce management as well. Okay, so accounting, forecasting, uh, budgeting, mm -hmm. I put those all in similar. Yeah. So just planning for how much money you, your company will need to raise as capital for a project um, that the, you can't just go get. Of two, three, four billion dollars from the bank account at, at a moment's notice. So planning what you need and when you need it by excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another so I think it can be used as an easy estimate for like a similar project in the future. Like um, if you get your estimate for this project, if like ten years down the road you into something similar. Okay. You can just go back to that. So if you do it properly now, you'll be able to do it properly in the future. You'll have a better idea of your needs in the future. So that's a good good point. We'll see a lot of these estimates rely on using previous data. So if you could put in-house data for a previous project, your quality of estimate for future projects, especially if you're working for a big company that's producing, um, I'm just, obviously I've got pharmaceuticals in my mind from most recently, but these sorts of companies, they're building new, new manufacturing facilities in other countries, but it's the same equipment being rebuilt in another site. So if they've got good estimates the first time around, they can be able to use that for future. Um, there's a, there might be costs that, um, that go behind the, the face costs, like uh, importing taxes on equipment and stuff like that. Okay, so taking into account other costs such as taxes, import duties, want to have a good estimate of those as well. Yeah. These are all great ideas. Anything else? Um, if we have like two projects to pick between and we have a budget to see which one costs mm -hmm. Okay, so planning and budgeting, I would I would tie that in as a combination of these two points again. Feasibility and budgeting, good one. Good. Um, what if how do companies or if you were working for a company right now and you needed to install a new heat exchanger? What would be the, one of the first things you do to try and establish a budget for the exchange? What might you consider as, as one of your options? If you're, if you're totally lazy, <laughs> call the vendor. Call the vendor, okay. So that's often what people think might be a good idea, is to call the vendor. Let's uh, talk a minute why that might not be the best idea. Depends if the vendor is installing it for you. Okay, so the vendor may be installing it for you, and then do you have a handle on those costs of the? Well, it's like, are they going to set up shopping? 
do everything for you, or are they <coughs> selling you the equipment and you're going to have to figure everything out? Right. Okay. So there's the the cost as well as the cost of the vendor and then installation that may be handled by the vendor. I, what I'm getting along the lines of here is, what are some of the issues regarding you sitting in your office phoning up a vendor? Uh, are there any? And rather than you doing the work yourself to estimate the cost. Okay, from the size, you may not be conveying the correct information to the vendor. That could be one. Yeah. You're trusting the vendor's math and calculations. Yeah. Anything else? Same thing. You're just a man ripping you off. But they're not ripping you off. Okay. Yeah. Confidentiality. Confidentiality is an important one. Um, if you're if you're pr producing a new flow sheet. Um, the vendor is not just going to say, well, you want a heat exchanger, here's a cost. They're going to say, well, what's flowing through, what's coming from upstream, temperatures, pressures. They're going to want to know a bit more information about the materials passing through to get you an, an estimate. And if that's a confidential flow sheet, you can be sure that that vendor is going to be talking with your competitors in very short time after that. Um, despite NDA agreements, NDA agreements are almost never honored in the industry. So those are, <laughs> it's true, I see it all the time. So it's, it's um, there's an ethical issue here. Uh, also, you can't, um, sometimes just even asking for a phone has somewhat of an intention to purchase. Um, and so you may need your supplier to, to think that they're, uh, you're going to be, they're going to be awarded the contract. And that's also not an ethical, um, ethical thing to be doing. Uh, so there's confidentiality. You need to be able to judge the bids from other suppliers or from other um, third-party contractors that who might be installing it for you. You need to be able to judge what their quotation is, whether it's reasonable or not. So that implies you should have an estimate in your mind already of what this equipment's cost is. So that when you evaluate these multiple bids coming in, like the example of uh, me having a, someone coming in to redo my washroom at home, I should be able to say, well, I know what a new toilet, a new basin, a new plumbing, and wiring, and tiling, and all of those separately should be, and add them up to make sure that, okay, that's a reasonable estimate that this contract has come up with, or no, this guy's uh, really overcharging me, or there's, there's this guy that's undercutting me, and he's probably not going to be in business in a few months and even finish the job for me. So you need to know uh, those, those ballpark figures. And then finally, the vendor is going to give you the price of the equipment, probably, and not, in, not install. But there's all sorts of other costs that go with it. We're going to see here that the cost of the equipment after installation is usually three to five times that of just the capital cost of the unit itself. So um, we, we would have a better idea internally of not, it's not just the heat exchanger we're installing. There's piping going in and out, what the extent of that piping is, how many bends and elbows there are, um, what the racking and the height is around it, what the painting needs to be that's done to finish it off, any concrete blocks and supports and, and mounting for that unit. Those costs add up very, very rapidly. Um, and as a result, the final project cost, just on one unit, as simple as a heat exchanger, are three to five times just the heat exchanger cost itself. Okay, so I really like some of these, these ones up here. Some of them match those there that Dr. Marlin had. So uh, this is not in your slides, but just to uh, put this in perspective again, it's kind of something that you've seen in your second year 2D and 2F courses. We work with diagrams that look like this, right? So this is the standard thing you see your first year, uh, second year of ChemEng, with uh, flows going in and out. There's a separator, another separator here, recycle stream, kilogram per hour or moles per hour flow rate. This is a very preliminary estimate. This is what we would call the order of magnitude estimate. This is the idea with the engineers sitting around in the room brainstorming different configurations of the flow sheet. So you're producing, in this case, we're taking toluene and hydrogen, and we want to convert that over to benzene, and we're going to have some mixed gases as well as our, our, our two inputs on two outputs. We're brainstorming different alternatives. We could come up with three or four different block flow diagrams like this. How do we quickly screen between those three or four alternatives is what we're going to learn um, very shortly, next starting next week. Then you would go from 
from that flow sheet very quickly turns into a flow sheet that looks like this, where we've got a bit more detail on some basic pumps and valves uh, required compressors over here. We've now just taken our separating column instead of a separating block. We've realized that that's a distillation column of sorts there. So, and we've got a fire heater here. We're trying to consider utilities. This would be, I would say, we're now going from our order of magnitude to a more detailed estimate. You're now already at this point, you're probably going to have spent about 0 to 2% of the final project budget. Even just to get to this point. So in terms of number of hours, there's a substantial number of engineering hours just to go from here to here. Then you would go from that flow sheet to this one, where you've got even more detailed units now. Um, not shown on this slide, but there would be all the flow rates, the energy um, terms, temperatures of the various streams. And then the final stage where we were ending up with as built almost, or close to as built. This is where we've got a definitive estimate that's probably in, with an error of about five to 10%. Um, and these are the diagrams that are handed over to the contractors to then build the units. This is, uh, if you're wondering where this comes from, this is just this part of the flow sheet. So if we just take that, that section over here, um, this is what that part looks like with our final control elements, our control systems in place, safety interlocks considered, um, far more detailed accounting for the utilities, materials of construction have already been thought out and specified. Um, so this is where, you, at this point, you've, you've probably spent five to 10, maybe even 20% of the final project's budget. And in some companies, these drawings only get finalized around when 60 to 80% of the final project budget has been spent. So it's a very much, it's an iterative step um, that, we, that we follow here. It's not just, not produce this drawing and then go specify the costs. It's drawing, estimate the costs, iterate, fine tune, revise the drawings, hand them out to contractors, they come back with problems um, that they've identified, revise. And so the project budget very quickly grows as we go from these uh, from this most basic flow sheet to, to that. And the accuracy with which we estimate the, the cost of each one of the units in there um, gets, gets refined. So here's, um, so here's order of magnitude, the study estimate, and then the definitive estimate. So we can see our accuracy. I would even take this and, and make this larger. Many textbooks have that going from minus 40 to plus 100%. So when you're at that level, you're, you're off by almost double the amount in many, in many cases. So that accuracy really should be even, even larger than that. So this is the stage where we're screening alternatives, we're looking at those different block flow diagrams. And we'll, we'll see today how one, one way of doing that, um, estimating that order of magnitude. As, our, as we refine and improve, um, then our accuracy becomes tighter and tighter. We've made major choices on the unit operations, though we've done nothing yet on the utilities and control loops and all that. And that comes down in the definitive stage where that happens between about minus five and plus fifteen. When you end up. So, so there is unfortunately no shortcut of getting to that that final stage. Um, there's a substantial cost spent. The numbers that I have from another source uh, from Turton's yellow textbook have that at this stage you've spent between 20 and 70% of your project budget. And here order of magnitude, you probably spent zero to about 2% of your budget. And in the study phase is about 5 to 10% of your budget is spent. Okay, so zero to two for that first level of total dollars, zero to two percent, five to 10%, and then here it's about 20 to 70%, as much as 70% in some situations. So that's a substantial amount of money spent, even just the engineering time and hours to get to those capital cost estimates. So Dr. Long has mm -hmm. note that in many cases, just the time of the engineer's time to develop those flow sheets and then to take those flow sheets and convert them over to dollar estimates can be several hundred of thousands of dollars. But that's usually rolled into the, um, to the cost of the project itself. Okay, uh, there's one final diagram that I'd like to just quickly show you. Um, I'll post this one on the website because I think it's quite nice. It's a nice breakdown. Uh, here it's showing the situation in reverse. Here's where we do our most basic estimate. 
um, and what are the sort of things that we consider. So for a most basic estimate, this black box says we've got rough sketches of the process diagram. We've only got preliminary sizing information available, approximate sizes of, of and type of construction, rough quantities of water, steam, and, and electricity. And at this stage of the project, our estimates range between about plus or minus 40% in terms of error. As we move to getting more and more detailed cost information, so this is a list of information you will require to develop that cost estimate. As you move from right to left here, your estimates error gets smaller and smaller. So for this course project that your group has selected, you're probably going to be at about at least the second column. The first column would be inappropriate for this project, uh, for this course. You need to be somewhere between the second and third stage over here in terms of the, the items that you consider in your, in your capital cost estimates. So we're going to be looking at that starting next week. But what we, I'd like to take a look at is uh, this just very preliminary is how we get a rough estimate of this capital cost. Of the equipment. Later on, we'll look at manufacturing costs. So, what are your um, salaries and those day to day costs going to look like? So, for capital costs, we're, we'll look at uh, two, two major methods here. Uh, very, uh, sorry, we'll look at two methods very briefly, and then we'll look at this important method, the bare module method. I'll start that section on Tuesday. The turnover ratio and max factor. Um, let's just take a look at the turnover ratio. This is uh, exactly what it is. The turnover is the number of times we can match gross sales with our fixed capital. So the ratio between gross sales divided by fixed capital gets you the number of times you can turn over that money. So for a very profitable company, that turnover ratio would be eight. That's implying that for a given amount of fixed capital, their sales are eight times that cost of the, that capital. That's phenomenal, right? So you invest your money and then the sales you make from that equipment are eight times the money you invested. That's great to so have a high turnover. In the, in the chemical industry, that number is closer to one. So it's an easy thing to work with. If you can estimate what the gross annual sales would be, take that dollar figure as a rough estimate of what the, cap, of the fixed capital cost would be. But this is a very extremely crude estimate. I cannot emphasize this enough. This estimate is between minus 50 to 100 okay. percent. So this is the sort of estimate that Don Wood says in his book. If your boss is walking past you in the passage and says, hey, what do you think it would cost if we could build a plant that has sales of $5 million for some fine chemical? Your answer is it would be about $5 million. So if your annual sales are about five million, a rough estimate of your, the capital cost would be about the same figure. There's no more to this number. It's a, it's a two, three minute discussion, but it's extremely crude. So if you say to your boss, it's five million, what you should actually say to your boss, no, it's between 0 0.5 times five to 10 million. So in other words, 2.5 to 10 million is what the plant would cost. Don't quote the 5 million figure, quote the range. So we never, whenever it comes to this part of the course, we, we never quote the value we actually calculate from the formulas up there. We always, we calculate it, but then we take the lower bound and the upper bound and we quote that as our answer. So these estimates are within an error of minus 50% to 100% in error. So if my base price is 5 million, I don't quote that as my answer. I say, no, the cost of this plant is 2.5 to $10 million. That's what it would cost us to produce this, this plant. Okay. That's how to use the turnover ratio. The next ratio is, uh, is Lang's factor. This is, a, again, another very crude estimate with similar magnitude of error. But what this error, uh, what this factor does is really it just shows you how, if you know the rough sum of the major equipment items. So if you, if you had, from some other method, which we're going to learn about soon, a rough estimate of the major equipment items in the flow sheet, to get your total capital cost, 
we multiply this sum of the major equipment items either by a number that ranges somewhere between three and five, depending on which industry you're in. So it just gives you a total idea of the total capital cost that you would need. But it does require you to have some estimate from, from another technique to get the cost of the major equipment items. So we'll look at, that, look at that technique starting on Tuesday. But it gives you that idea that you usually have to at least triple or sometimes as much as uh, five times that, that cost to get the total cost. So on Monday, I'll cover this, this their module method. But what I just want to do is jump ahead in the slides to slide, slide number one, three, four because you'll need this for assignment five. So in assignment five, we said that we were getting a reactor from Germany. And this reactor from Germany was 20,000 tons per year. So the reactor from Germany was 20,000 tons per year and it cost 5 million euros. We're requiring a reactor that's half the size. Is it fair to take half the price of the German reactor? We, we expect not because of, of the fact that if you buy something that's bigger, there's a decrease in the price. Okay, we can usually uh, get a diminishing price for, for a larger capacity. And that's exactly what this relationship is telling us here. The value of N that you can use as a rule of thumb is 0.6. Okay, so let's take a look at how to use this cost of A of the new design. So the cost of the Brazilian design. divided by the cost of the German design is equal to the ratio of some factor to the 0.6. What factor would that be? is the, which one you can use to help make a point. So 10,000 times per year divided by 20,000 times per year. One of the factors, it may not be the best one, is, is to relate it to what this unit is, is the throughput through it. So a bigger reactor would, would be able to have a bigger throughput, a smaller reactor, smaller throughput. So in this case, the, that factor would be one possible feature to select. So the throughput of this reactor is 10,000 uh, tons per year divided by 20,000 uh, tons per year. And to inform that, you can calculate the cost in euro of the, be of the Brazil reactor. So it's not a straight division by two. So use this, uh, this relationship for a sign in five. Uh, we'll, we'll get, we're, I was planning to be at this point in the course, but I'll, I'll do this often in the tutorials and the science. There'll be material that you need to read ahead for um, being self-directed learning class. This is uh, part of the deal. So let's, uh, let's take a look at Monday. There'll be a tutorial on some topics related to sensitivity analysis. I may work in some of the capital cost estimation. Um, otherwise, have